So in this video, we're going to turn $80 headphones into $500 headphones using nothing other than a magic hat. You ready? Here we go. All we do is place the hat over the headphones, say abracadabra, $500 headphones. Pretty cool trick, huh? No, just kidding. In fact, we're not going to even change the sound of these headphones at all. But we are going to change them from being basic isolation to state-of-the-art isolation. Now, you can't do this with any headphones. Obviously, ones that have an open back are going to be impossible. But these Sonys, these are MDR V6s, very similar to the MDR 7506. Uh, which is current production. MDR V6s are no longer in current production. Uh, it's one of the most popular headphones in the film, music, production, television industry. In fact, these were released in the 1980s. They're still being sold as the MDR 7506 at least uh, by places, pro audio places like Sweetwater and B&H Photo. B&H Photo says that this out of the 175 headphones they sell these are number one. Not bad for a product that was first released in 1983, 85. I'm getting conflicting information on the web, but sometime in the mid or early 80s, they first, first came out as the MDR V6. So what we're going to do is change this into great sound isolating headphones simply by changing the ear pad to this gel ear pads. The original ear pad was a foam ear pad. This is what a disintegrated one looks like, uh, but they're filled with foam. Foam is not great at sound isolation. Gel is. In this video, I'm going to explain why. So these are the Sony MDR 7506 headphones. It's the sort of pro version of the MDR V6, which was sort of the consumer version. Uh, there are arguments about they're di different or not. I looked up the driver parts, the actual speaker element, the driver. It's the exact same part. So it seems silly to argue that these sound different. I think people get minor differences either in their head or their headphone coupler they use. They don't position the headphone exactly the same way between their first experience and their second experience. So they measure subtle differences and then they just sort of imagine that they're going to sound different. But they're really the same headphones. And the reason I'm saying we're changing this to a $500 headphone, even though these sell for about 80 bucks or so, is these. These are the Remote Audio HN, that stands for High Noise, 7506 DBC. Now, what, what makes these so similar? Read what it says there in the lower left. MDR 7506 drivers with special baffling. So they're admitting right up front that they use Sony MDR 7506 speaker elements in their headphones. So the actual cup, the plastic cup that holds them is obviously different. The headband is different. They give you a boom mic. Uh, so these are definitely a much different kind of setup. But uh, when I first discovered that, wow, somebody is using this quality headphone driver in noise isolating headphones, uh, as it says there, extreme noise isolation. So who are these for exactly? As it says here, helicopter pilots. Uh, you can use them on a firing range, rock concerts, any environment that has very high noise. But these are professional-grade monitoring headphones, so they're exceptionally accurate, which is exactly what I look for in audio gear. I want it to be an accurate representation of the recording that I'm listening to. Uh, so, when I discovered these headphones existed, my first question was, oh my god, can I get their ear pads? And the reason why is because I learned a little trick from a headphone designer a few years ago, I'll describe in more detail in a bit, about the headphone pads being really the most important part of noise isolation when it comes to headphones and what you want to look for. And then I discovered, through a little more digging, Bingo! They sell the earpads separately. Yay! 
and not too expensive, $39.99. That's reasonable considering the headphones themselves are 500 bucks. Anyway, so I bought the remote audio gel ear pads and I installed them. It was a little bit difficult, but I was able to get it, get it on. The only thing you need to know is that <clears throat> they are just a oval like this. You're missing this foam part in the middle. So you need to cut that out and recycle that from the older headphones, which I then glued onto the plastic oval ring of the Sony with just some Elmer's glue. So I had to wrestle on these ear pads, but I eventually did, and boy am I glad I did. Let's talk about what they do. What a great improvement. The isolation is superb. I think I'm getting better bass extension too. When I listen to my deep bass test track, which I have a YouTube video for, if you want to look, look at it, uh, check it out. Here's a link in the upper right. Uh, you can hear bass easily down to 20 hertz, maybe even a tick lower than 20 hertz, which is pretty impressive because normal MDR V6 headphones that I use normally kind of conk out somewhere in the mid 20s, maybe even uh, low 30s. So being able to get the bass extension down to only 20 hertz or even a tick lower is pretty cool. So in order to demo the sound isolation of these headphones, I was going to use my new binaural microphone, just sort of a simulated head. Uh, but the problem is, these ears jut out so much, they touch, and it doesn't get a, a good seal. That's problem number one. Problem number two, these are designed to push against flesh. When they push against foam, which is not an air, air impermeable material, uh, sound can leak in from that point. Uh, so you don't want that. So these are not good for testing headphones, unfortunately. And finally, there's no support up here to hold the top of the headphones. Headphones rely on the top of your head as part of their suspension to hold it in position. And this doesn't have anything up here. I could maybe build something, but uh, it's not exactly practical. So unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to use these for the demo. But keep in mind, the sound isolation is bi-directional. Not only do these isolate sound coming in, they also isolate from sound going out. Anyway, the headphones are playing pretty darn loudly right now, and let's see what they'd sound like if they weren't touching each other. So that's with pink noise. Let's move on to music. So I once had a great conversation with a headphone designer who specifically made headphones for audiometry. They're the headphones you use when you go to the doctor's office to get your hearing tested. And he taught me a whole bunch of stuff about what you want to look for in sound isolation for headphones, which I'm going to show you here in this video. So here's your ear, here's your head. Uh, here's the headphones that you're going to put over your head. Sometimes I'm just going to depict that as just a cup. I'm not going to show the sort of full headband, just to let you know in advance. What we're going to talk mostly about, which he said is the most important thing, is the ear pad. Uh, most people use foam ear pads because it's soft, flexible, inexpensive, uh, and it has a reasonably good seal to it. Gel, however, is what you really want to use. So here's the wire that leads up to the driver, which makes the beautiful music into your ear. Uh, here's the foam ear pad, most typically used on headphones. We'll be talking about the uh, gel ear pad later. Gel ear pads are going to be blue color. Uh, but we're first talking about normal headphones, so we're using a foam ear pad.
Uh, anyway, the green color guy, green is good, so you want that. However, you have a noise source problem you're trying to get rid of, and that causes a wave of noise to come by to the headphone. So B for blue, B is bad, green is good. The way noise canceling headphones work is there's a little microphone. They have some electronics in the headphones, uh, which intercept the incoming signal. They're usually cheap electronics, so that's why I wrote here cheap mixer electronics. And what it does is it, it takes the incoming music signal and it mixes it with sound it hears from a microphone of the bad noise you want to avoid. See, this is the wave of, uh, this blue wave is the bad noise you want to avoid. However, it enters the ear cup. Uh, and so you hear it. It's much quieter because the ear cup blocks some of it, but some gets through. What the electronics do in noise canceling headphones is they create an inverted noise, uh, which is out of phase from that uh, noise that its little microphone heard. And in theory, the red and the blue cancel each other so that the only thing left is the good sound, the green sound. Here's the problem. They use cheap electronics. You know, if you buy state-of-the-art DACs, state-of-the-art headphone amps, all those noise quality, all of those great sound qualities that they have and low noise, low distortion and whatnot, that flies out the window if you're then going to send it to a mixer with cheap electronics, uh, which in then injects what it thinks is the out-of-phase noise. That's one problem, is it degrades the sound quality of the music you're listening to. Another problem is it really only works in the bass frequencies. Uh, doing it at higher frequencies, much above one kilohertz even, uh, has problems. Uh, for one thing, it can cause a squealing noise. You get a feedback loop when you take the headphones off, and people hate hearing that squealy noise. Sometimes hear that from people's hearing aids also. I hate hate hearing that. Uh, so it's feedback, just like a, a microphone on stage will have feedback. And they avoid that by addressing the low frequencies only. So that's why I don't typically recommend noise-canceling headphones. They're only good at the bass. Uh, they degrade the quality of the music. Uh, they have their place, but uh, I try to avoid them. I much prefer uh, noise-isolating headphones, which is the topic of this video. So for the earphone cup, you want, unfortunately, conflicting things. Of course, you want your headphones to be light as a feather, so they're comfortable and you can wear them for a long time with very little fatigue, yet you want headphones to have very strong clamping force. For instance, here is a depiction of inward force against the head. You'd be surprised how much clamping force professional grade sound isolation headphones have. They're not exactly comfortable. People are often surprised when they first put them on. Uh, can actually hurt if you wear them for a long time, so inward clamping force should be tight. You need a very strong inward clamping force to ensure that you have a good seal, because even if you have a tiny half millimeter air opening, uh, that kills your sound isolation, unfortunately. Besides a heavy clamping force, you also want your exterior material of the ear cup uh, to be made of some very hard-as-a-rock inflexible material. Plastic isn't ideal, but it's inexpensive and it's what we usually use. If you want a good demo of why this is important, take a drinking glass, like a tumbler, uh, and put it over your ear, much like this ear cup in this diagram, and push it against your head and listen to how much sound it isolates. 
I was amazed at how good it isolates sound, and that's because glass is hard as a rock, and you really need that in order to uh, keep the sound waves out. So you want it to be thick and inflexible, and all plastics are not created equal. Acrylic, for instance, is going to do much better than a soft, bendable plastic like ABS. Uh, so some sort of a very inflexible plastic is sort of a good compromise. You also want it to be curved, like a sphere or an ellipsoid. Uh, not flat. And the problem with flat surfaces is they act as sound-grabbing membranes, kind of like a microphone as a flat disc. You don't want flat surfaces. They catch noise waves. You want curved surfaces uh, that do that as little as possible. Also, curved surfaces are stronger. Think of a building like the Capitol or the Astrodome. Uh, you have a very strong structure, again, so it doesn't flex. So what's the opposite of all of this? A flat, thin, flexible membrane. So it's got all the problems added together. It's thin, so it can flex. It's flat. So it, it absorbs, not absorbs, it, it uh, kind of takes in noise from one direction. All these noise waves all push against it. Whereas if, if it were a curved surface, the only sound wave that hits it directly is this one. All the others, the vector force analysis shows that only part of it is pushing inward. So let's again, again go back to that bad design, the flat disc design, which unfortunately Sony has a large flat outer membrane here. So the problem is a flat, thin, flexible surface, when it gets bombarded with sound waves, it can flex. Here's the animation showing the problem. So when the outer membrane gets struck by the external noise source, the entire surface, the membrane of the headphone cup, vibrates in and outwards, uh, causing a sound wave, a noise wave, to enter the ear. So you do not want your headphone cup to be flexible. So here's a wave animation from Falstead.com showing uh, how the headphones diffract at these edges. So this parabola shape is my representation of the ear cup. This is the entrance to the ear. Uh, so this red microphone probe is shown here on this graph, and the green one is hearing the same noise. This is the noise source. Uh, but unaffected by the barrier. Uh, now the noise source is stopped at the moment, uh, but let's uh, generate the noise. Pause. So as you hear, I'm as you see here, I'm just striking the outer edge of the ear cup. See, it's bouncing away from the ear cup. Now watch what happens when it hits the edge of the ear cup. Ooh. See that? In all directions, you get a new sound wave. That's called diffraction. And from that little point right there, you get a circular wave in all directions. Uh, but the direction we're concerned about is inward towards our ear, and we don't want that. Uh, so let's continue with the sound as it strikes the eardrum. So this represents the noise level striking the red probe, the eardrum, 1.22. Compare that, ooh, even less now. It's gone down to 0 0.5, 0 0.6, 0 0.7. Fortunately, you'd like to see it just settle down to one number, but it seems to constantly change a little bit. But it's somewhere under one. 
This is how noisy is the ear probe without any wall, without any barrier. Uh, 45, which is a, l a lot louder. Now I've tried changing the shape of this. Uh, for instance, if we bring it down to a flatter structure, But no matter what you do, you get diffraction at these two points here. And you can add all sorts of different shapes. It doesn't mu really much matter. Uh, there's always going to be diffraction right here and right here. Supposedly curved shapes have lef less diffraction, although I'm not really seeing that. It may depend on the frequency you use. Let's move up to a very high frequency clear the sound wave and start over. So ripple tank analysis may help you with the, your headphone design to some degree, but no matter what, you're going to get diffraction at this point here. Uh, so you need some kind of a blocking mechanism, an ear pad to go right here to stop this diffracted wave from striking your eardrum. Do you ever hear the expression, go pound sand? What that means is go do something that's impossible. You cannot compress sand. You also can't compress fluids or liquids or gels. They're not a compressy material. Foam, however, can compress, and that means it acts just like a spring. And you don't want that. What happens is the outer sound waves, when they bombard the ear cup, if you make it out of a springy material where it touches the head, that means the entire ear cup can bounce in and out on that springy material. Foam has a springiness to it. Gel does not. I'll demonstrate that by dropping this quarter. Notice it kind of bounces. Even flips over gel absorbs the fall. Here's an animation depicting the problem. So as you see, the external sound waves excite the ear cup and make it bounce back and forth against the head, and that generates its own new sound wave, that little blue wave going into the ear canal. Now, it could be analogous to the external sound, or it could be just the resonant the frequency of resonance of this entire uh, contraption. Either way, it's noise that you do not want. So that's the problem using foam as your ear pad material, is it acts like a spring. So you don't want to use foam. Instead, you want to use some material that does not compress, such as fluid, liquid, or gel. Gel or fluid-filled ear pads are also very good at giving you a great seal. That's important for bass reproduction. Uh, part of the way the headphone works is assuming that the inner air section is airtight. Uh, so gel is very good at giving you good, good bass reproduction, especially good deep bass extension, which I'm noticing on the uh, test track that I use. Uh, and it also helps fill in any, any air gaps if you're wearing eyeglasses or sunglasses. Uh, unfortunately, the temple of the eyeglasses can break the seal of a circumoral headphone design. Uh, but gel ear pads, uh, they're not as affected by this as uh, foam ear pads are. So why do you want to use a coiled cord? Coiled cords, they're always slack. They're never taut. And that prevents them from acting like a uh, like a string telephone, you know, those tin can telephones. Uh, which were a big fad back in the 1800s, I guess, before we invented real telephones that use electricity. Believe it or not, they even sold them commercially in New York City. Something like 200 rich people signed up and bought string telephone communication. It's kind of hard to believe, but, you know, telephones didn't exist yet, and this really was a way to conduct sound from one home to another. Anyway, you don't want that with headphones. 
uh, you have two forms of noise coming in from the headphone cord. One is if it brushes against something, it can cause a vibration that travels up to the ear cup. That's sometimes called cord chafing noise. You don't want that. There's also the problem that just having any taut wire in the air can act almost like a microphone and pick up vibrations in the air, kind of like a reverse violin. The way a violin works is you pluck the cord, you pluck the string, and it vibrates and that causes sound but it works the other way too sound can vibrate the string uh, and if that string is vibrating if this incoming cord is vibrating that can ear vibrate the entire ear cup and you hear that as noise so we want to use a slack cord to our headphones and a coiled cord assures that you're not going to have any transmission of vibration up to the ear cup you also want to put a rubber grommet here also to help absorb the noise you especially need coiled cords if you're moving your head around because that causes this to move around and it potentially can brush against other surfaces in your room, even just your chair you're sitting in. So you want to use a coiled cord for sound isolation purposes because you don't want to pick up vibration from the device you're plugged to. You don't want to pick up cord chafing noise if the cord is rubbing against something, say when you move your head or if it just swings left and right because of the wind. And you don't want to pick up room vibration vibrating the cord, sort of like sound vibrating a, a string in a string instrument. So right now you're looking into a plastic pail filled with water. Uh, we have a microphone just off camera to the right, which is where the sound is being recorded to. People think that uh, earphone ear pads are good at isolating sound, either by blocking sound or absorbing sound. Uh, that's not true. They're not very good at either of those things. If it gets thick, you can use it as an absorbing material. It doesn't block sound very well at all. And the proof of that is the fact that we often make uh, windscreens on microphones out of this exact same material, the same foam. Uh, it doesn't block or isolate sound very well at all. For instance, when I put it on this mic, the very one that you're listening to, You'll notice I sound roughly the same. Uh, there may be a slight loss in the very highest frequencies. Nothing, nothing gigantic though. And that's why we can use it as a uh, windscreen. So the mic's going to be slightly off camera. Or I'll just show sort of the tip of it here. Because what we're going to do is I'm going to clink two coins together above water and below water uh, so that you can hear that the sound has trouble. Uh, jumping from water medium to air, uh, so it should be quite a bit quieter when it's underwater. Here we go.
So I measured this before and I was getting somewhere around a 15 to 20 dB reduction uh, by jumping from one medium to another. And keep in mind, gel or liquid filled earphones have a double whammy of that. And here's why. The external noise that you're trying to block comes in it has trouble getting into the gel that's a 15 to 20 db cut attempting to enter the gel and then there's another 15 to 20 db cut because of the acoustic impedance barrier of jumping from the gel back into air uh, so that's an appreciable amount of uh, sound loss uh, so that's why these work so well at blocking sound One more time. Above water, underwater.